program is Professor David Donohan from Stanford University. So I believe everyone in the room knows David and his achievements. So I will not spend more time on the introduction. Let's just start this exciting talk. Thanks, David. Be really hard for me to get started. Um, Nancy and you have welcomed us into your home and family. I'm so sorry. And uh, we really appreciate the friendship that you've shown over the years. I love the pictures in the slideshow. The, the picture of Madeline with you is very touching. And uh, you introduced us to her. And then we saw her as we went around Berkeley and would talk with her and interact. And uh, it was just very touching to feel the extended family. Uh, we were invited, say, to Passover Seders. We were invited to family weddings at the Brazilian Room. and. Uh, so many more moments, um, yeah. Uh, but also there's a lot of professional moments that sometimes by random chance, I happen to be around for those. And you may, you may not be aware of all of these, but um, well, okay, when you were elected to NAS, there was a party at the de department here in Evans Hall. Uh, same thing with MacArthur Fellowship, but um, actually we were in Israel and saw you get your honorary degree from Hebrew University on Mount Scopus, looking down over the Dead Sea. Um, yeah, that just happened. Um, also, I had the good fortune to see you get an honorary degree at ETH. Um, and I guess there was the knighting or whatever it's called <laughs> in Princeton. Th these are a lot of important professional moments. And uh, somehow they've all happened in your life, but they've also happened in my life. And it's the, the, the fact that I've been able to be part of that really accumulates over your life, over anyway, my life. And uh, so I also have to say thank you. Well, to you for having all these professional successes, but uh, a number of people in the audience made these things possible. So, uh, and then there are people who are not here or no longer with us that I won't be able to mention, but, um, you know, as we saw, John Xing enabled the Princeton moment and uh, Peter Buhlmann and it enabled the ETH moment and Lisa and all of her sidekicks have en enabled this moment. And this is gonna be very memorable to me, stacking it on all the other moments. So, okay, so this is kind of uh, how I first met Peter, pretty much. I would say around this age with this kind of demeanor and he was always very calm. And I love what Lisa said, that he always assumes the best about people. It just feels like exactly that's who he is. And that's part of the magic, as we'll see, that he's got a tremendous cast of collaborators. And that wouldn't be so without the kind of psychological mojo that he puts into his relationships. Uh, so I really treasure the moments that he was counseling me in my early career. And I know there are many other people who had similar moments and were sort of a loyal band on your side. Um, another thing is that doesn't come from nowhere. I think it's, it's kind of important to realize that there was an earlier generation that had also very positive attitude. Part of it was 
what comes from being, you know, at the pinnacle. Berkeley in those days, in many dimensions, was so far ahead of so many other places that it was a kind of, uh, well, we just heard about supremacy, but it was, it was a kind of qualitative superiority that, uh, you know, couldn't have been anywhere before except maybe, I don't know, in math under David Hilbert and something like that, you know. Uh, I, I just love the look here of David Blackwell because it, it, it sort of indicates the alertness, confidence, and so on. And you can see that Eric Lehman is a very kind person. And you can see that you know, Peter is young with this energy and, and he's just a very positive person. Okay, so let, let's talk about Peter's scholarship. You're at about a thousand citations per year in Google Scholar every year you've been alive. So that means you, you didn't get all that. You started quite early. Uh, you know, various things have, have produced that and will continue to produce citations over time. And it was very interesting. I went, I went through, you know, at this point, so many dozens of papers, and there are a lot of papers in your profile I didn't even know about. And um, my favorites that I think are just incredible are sometimes not even visible. Like they're just tiny little citations compared to some of the others. Uh, so I just thought I'd go you know, decade by decade, and you can see here, even, so this is in the Google Scholar era, and there's a lot of things that have been erased because of internet. And yet, here are these papers that were written in the 60s by Peter still being cited today at you know, rates that would be significant for many members of the audience had they just been written now. Uh, in, in, and some of these are on robustness, but there's a great deal of variety here it's, uh, um, and so I'll know more about the robustness story, but other people will know about lots of other things. And uh, then we go into the 70s and there are things on non-parametric density estimation. There's a data analysis project on uh, sex bias in graduate admissions that became a total classic. Uh, there's a variety of papers on robustness and, um, and so on. Then we get into the 80s. There's a canonical paper on the bootstrap. There's the foundation of the subject of semi-parametric estimation. There's the squabble with uh, D.R. Cox and George Box. Uh, and there's a, a great foundational paper of Peter with uh, Yaakov Ritov which you know, rocked my world when it came out and, and so on. So th there's a lot there, but then it continues in the 90s. And um, you know, I'm not an expert on all of these papers. So that's actually the thing that's very striking about this. I thought I knew Peter, I realized I know a fraction, maybe a fraction of a fraction of Peter and, and uh, it's a lot of work to keep up with the scope of what he's been doing. So in the aughts, this continues and he's moved into high dimensional statistics and, the, and network models. And then in the last decade, I guess there's a reissue of his book with Shell, which is getting uh, a fresh, huge collection of citations in that decade. He's also working in, uh, comp bio and getting tons of sites associated with that. Um, maybe this is a re reissue of the original work of Bickel, Goetz, and Von Sweat that came out associated maybe with uh, memorial volume, et cetera. So, uh, but it's still a lot of sites. And then it continues into this decade and I just heard about some work of his that I plan to cite. So there's gonna be future citations. 
This is the, the curve over time. So that the bars here are indicating decade by decade what's going on. This sum. Uh, okay, safe. Uh, so you can see here total citations scaling up. So 16,000 in the teens decade that we've recently left. Uh, if we can just look at publications issued per decade and the max citations of any publication, it's all heading up and it's accelerating recently. This is uh, like really, really impressive. Um, I wanted to say that despite you know, all of this, I have a lot of favorite papers. There's a lot of things that Peter has done that are impactful, but some of it is not high on the list of citations at this time. The world is, you know, interested in other things at this moment. But I, I thought I'd just mention in my own life what's been important. Uh, so Peter, from his early citations on robustness that I mentioned to you, um, was, I guess, invited to participate in a Princeton robustness year, which issued the book on the left on which he's a co-author. And he got to interact with John Tukey, who was my undergraduate advisor. Um, and uh, about as different from the Berkeley way of doing things as could be. And somehow Peter got along with him, collaborated, and something useful came out of, out of this. This book, uh, which you know I have a well-thumbed copy, uh, sort of described the first you know, computational experiment on a whole bunch of conjectures that reached sort of a, a high scale and was trying to implement a whole paradigm of doing these things. I had never seen that before. I'd never seen anything like it in journals. Um, so I found it fascinating. Now, I, I was Fine Hall there when you were there for that year? Okay, so, so there's Fine Hall, the math building. Because of the success of that book, I guess, um, the, the math department at Princeton and the stat group got uh, funded a PDP-11 that was running the first Unix outside of Bell Labs. And by my sophomore year, I was the manager of this computer. And so the success of that book, which put Princeton in such high esteem on robustness, got them this computer, which got me the job, which got me into statistics. So there's, there are levels of impact that are happening behind the scenes here that you can't simply see from the citations. So my job was to write stat software. There was nothing at the time. So I wrote a stat package, which was called ISP at the time. And uh, what made it a useful package, let's see if I have the right things here. Um, well, I, these are a, a bunch of papers that I learned as a sophomore and just like, you know, rocked my world and, you know, review articles on robustness. And this paper is very important for maybe what comes next, uh, characterizing asymptotic variants of lots of estimators and comparisons with variants of uh, the mean and so on. Okay, but this paper, for, for those of you who think Peter's not applied, so, so this paper is what I think made ISP possible, namely 
it allowed to compute robust estimates in the, you know, this is stat package, right? And the, you know, Princeton robustness study has just been done. So this stat software better be able to do something, right? And in, in that dimension. So what it did was based on this, or, you know, obviously it had various options, but this is one of them. And I remember carefully reading this paper, implementing it and so on. And, um, I was just a, a wild, you know, junior at this point, and no one was telling me what to do. So I, I just did it. I implemented it, and um, the software worked. And before I knew it, the the stat group at Princeton was distributing it all around to the Unixes that were being, you know, proliferating. So eventually, the Berkeley people, I think, with Jim Reed's, started using that. Um, so I think the popularity of the package was that it could actually do this. Like you couldn't at the time really get robust linear model calculations, but you could through this package, which was by just an, it happened to implement this because some crazy junior read this paper. Uh, then it, be, then Berkeley took it over and the stat lab was the worldwide distributor of the package, which they renamed BLSS. And there was a staff here that was maintaining it, improving it. And they went far beyond anything I could ever have imagined. But a, a key thing is that in that staff, a person was Ross Ihaka. Ross was a founder of R. And so, like what really happened here is the computability through this paper spawned a package which spread around. Then it led to, to actually being able to pay staff and it led ultimately to foundational work that gave us R by bringing more talent into the field. First, just showing them a stat package that you know, an undergraduate could have thought of and then let's do better. So th those are some consequences you may not have thought of, of your work. It's just the ability to compute something can go through a series of chain reactions. Okay, well, a, a series of canonical papers that I became aware of as a graduate student and after uh, is listed here, and they're all not about robustness. But the key thing that you have to know is that the first one has an important discovery of Peters. And at about the same time, I think, you know, Boris Levit and um, Alfio Marazzi had something touching on this, which is uh, the calculation of Bayes risk in a normal mean estimation problem with squared error of loss is isomorphic to the calculation of the asymptotic variance of the kind that you would do in robust estimation. This came out of the fact that in the 60s, Peter had papers both on Bayes risk problems and on robustness. He knew both of these things, so he could make that discovery. Now, the, the connection is deeper than just say the, the exact value of the Bayes risk tells you the exact value of an asymptotic variance. It's actually that the exact optimal Bayes rule is rigidly connected to the exact optimal scoring function that you would have to be using to get uh, the you know, correct uh, uh, asymptotic variance according to this formula. So there's, there's an actual isomorphism between robustness uh, and granted, you know, in a scalar univariate problem and uh, Bayes risk for one observation in that scalar univariate problem. And then once you understand that, or Peter understood that, you can do several problems all at once. And, and he does a, a few of these, uh, just speaking on behalf of Ian, I feel like Ian later has papers where he figures this all out in the Poisson case and so on. A lot of other people at the conference 
might have been influenced by this. I'm just mentioning things that I know personally. So if I'm forgetting to mention you, please, uh, and, you know, we're trying to get somewhere uh, in referring to some things. I probably can't refer to everything. Uh, out of this, actually, there's a last paper here. So John Collins was here yesterday, but uh, he, he had to go early. And uh, I was speaking to him about this. So I, I think if you look at the third one of these, which appeared in Sankhya, it kind of summarizes everything that's needed from the others, if you, you know, can, can decode it. And there he's trying to uh, just discuss the problem of we have uh, families of distributions and we want to minimize the Fisher information over that. This comes out of a paper, it's not really a paper, it's a problem that was posed in SIAM in the problem section by Colin Mallows, who's a very distinguished uh, statistician, applied mathematician at Bell Labs back in the day. And Peter has you know, written papers on the Mallows metric and, and he's written papers on solving this specific problem and so on and so forth. Uh, let's minimize the Fisher information over mixtures of distributions. So Mallows had an idea for one such problem and uh, talked about it's frustrating that uh, he couldn't solve it and here's a guess and so on and so forth. So Peter and John's paper looked at that and several others and they described that there's a interesting discreteness property of all such solutions. And they spoke about the connection to finding the least favorable distribution for over classes of priors. And they spoke about the connection to the Hoover problem of finding the least favorable distribution for contamination and robustness problems. So they, they identified this as being really central to two central problems in statistics and they you know, characterize things. Now, I spoke to, to John yesterday and, and you know, by the rules of whatever was true, you know, what, whatever how one played the game of publishing in the, those days, uh, you might know something numerically about this problem, but you could never publish a thing about it. It would, there was just no outlet where anything, you know, you, it, 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 just silence, unless there was a closed form symbolic expression, then there's nothing, you know, it, it doesn't exist. So what one cannot reduce a closed form and prove, therefore one must be silent, were the rules of the day. I don't think that we have those rules anymore. In fact, I'll, I'll discuss how they've changed a little bit later. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, so I just wanna, you know, so coming out of this, I'll just say it's, it's influenced uh, my own work in a couple of ways. And I don't, uh, I can't list them all and so on and so forth, but uh, it, in some way I've worked on the problem that's associated with his uh, first paper here um, in comparing the minimax MSC, minimax Bayes risk over a restricted parameter space between a linear estimator and nonlinear estimator. And uh, Ian Johnstone and I have, uh, you know, looked at this particular problem as well. Um, Peter, you know, completely defined the whole problem of uh, what if you have a need to estimate really well at one given point, then how much does that hurt your risk everywhere else? That's somehow isomorphic to what if... Uh, 
you have a, a prior distribution that's a sparse prior that has a great deal of mass at one point, and then you know the, the other mass is spread out in some way. Um, and, and so this, which might not seem relevant um, to noise removal of sparse signals at like a you know coarse level is like isomorphic to it. So at the work that Ian and I did is, is kind of teasing out the consequences of that. So it goes on and on. There's a lot, a lot that one could uh, pull out of that line of work and, and uh, just not that much time. Now, but I, I wanted to, to say something that, that came out of those three papers, for me anyway which is uh, a family of work that was done with uh, Andrea Montanari and um, PhD student at the time, Ariane Malecki, who's now on the faculty at Columbia. Um, and this was the development of an algorithm called AMP, which Essentially, what the algorithm showed is that conceptually, if you undersample by not getting enough measurements, it's the same thing as complete data, but just adding noise. Of course, the measurements have to be collected in a special way, but it, that's exactly what compressed sensing is about. And so it was just transforming, you know only collecting 10% of the data you need to getting a significant amount more noise on a completely observed signal. And so that's what this, this paper was about. Uh, once you understand that, then you understand that if you have sparsity and you can do noise removal using some of the ideas that are kind of implicit in that work, uh, then it, it would be possible to recover something. The, the unusual thing is the notion of phase transition where in undersampling, you can do computational experiments that will show you that for a given amount of sparsity, uh, which could be measured in some way on this axis, there's a certain amount of incompleteness or undersampling such that up to a certain point, you're gonna, I'm assuming noiseless data to begin with, but very undersampled. Up to a certain point, you can exactly recover the underlying object. So, so we knew these curves by you know, experimental means and there was combinatorial geometry and so on and so forth. But um, in this work, which includes Ian at this point, what we, what we found is that if you look at a curve of the minimax risk as a function of the non-zeroness parameter, which is a thing that uh, Peter first defined in, in the paper in the Chernoff best strip, then depending on the estimator you're using and what the rules of the game are, these curves, actually gave you the previous curves. There's an exact isomorphism between the curves. There's just a deterministic rule that turns, once you know this, you know the other one. Um, and uh, one thing that we found interesting is this red curve here, which is one of the things that Peter wanted, like his, his paper with John Collins wanted well, it defined, so we computed it. And we computed the solution of the Mallow's problem numerically and computed this curve. And by the old rules of, of publication that has no <laughs> status, it could never be published. Ah, but we turned it into science. Namely, we then went out and made measurements uh, you know, experimentally of actual algorithms and show that they exactly fell along these curves. 
so then it's a it's a prediction and it's solving in this particular case uh, a non-convex optimization but today we would say it's actually fully rigorously solving it as long as you're within this regime okay and and i could tell you more it's it's this is all in the in the paper that i cited with ian and andrea now, at about the time that paper appeared, so Nuruddin and Peter Bickle and uh, Bean, who I don't know, uh, issued two papers in PNAS, and you know these were fantastic papers um, where they're doing M estimation in this high dimensional regression limit. These are great papers. I just want to point out, like by citations, they're way down in the, in the Peter oeuvre, even for the fact that they're less than a decade old. But you know, if I were given a hundred votes, I would give a hundred to each of them, or fifty, or whatever I'm allowed. Um, uh, so Andrea and I understood this in a different way, maybe, or maybe the same way, but we understood that what we had done with approximate message passing and this equivalence between incompleteness of data and denoising was equivalent by the same isomorphism that Peter first discovered, namely the problem in robustness in this case, robust regression is isomorphic to a problem in uh, Bayes' decision theory, in this case, noise removal from sparse signals. And uh, the other thing that is kind of amazing is some things that, that in Peter's original one-dimensional problem were a little bit like gaps where there was a difference between the Huber contamination model and the kind of model that Colin Mallows was mentioning that disappeared. Like in, in, in because this, there's some Gaussian extra noise that, that we had seen in the Bayes side of the equation and that Peter and Nuruddin had seen in the robustness side of the equation. So, just because of that, we could write this paper, which is, is just using the approach by approximate message passing to it, instead of doing a denoising, compressed sensing type problem, it could be done, do it for robust regression. Uh, and then just to come back to Peter's, the first paper that I ever listed here was a paper that, that Peter wrote where he, he's calculating the asymptotic variance of the Huber M estimator and various other kinds of estimators is Annals of Statistics 1965. And um, something that was very important in Peter Huber's mind was that the um, Huber M estimator could never, its variance could never blow up. Uh, in the same way that, say, a Humpel estimator or many other uh, canonical estimators, you could contaminate them to make the variance blow up. But in this high dimensional limit, that's no longer true. So I just, uh, I, I came home from, I think, uh, Peter's degree ceremony at ETH and decided hey, you know, at which we had lunch with Peter, Peter Huber and Effie and said, okay, this, this, that's what this is going on here, is that actually there's a relationship that Huber knew many years ago, but now in the high dimensional limit, there's a different relationship, which is like almost as simple, but that shows that the variance of the Huber M estimator can be infinite outside of 
a kind of phase transition. So uh, that sort of tied together a package of my PhD advisor, Peter's early work, like a lot of things coming together. Peter's isomorphism between Bayes' decision problems and robustness problems, like, uh, I know this is all sounding very vague, but it's a long, long story to get to every detail in the package. Um, and then there's some other work, which I, I've been doing a lot with, with, for example, Ian and other authors that's all inspired by this. And I don't have time really to get to it, I think, right? Isn't that true? Um, okay, so I've shown you these site counts and um, we've looked a little bit at the past. What about the future? Well, we're off to a good start in this decade. Uh, and maybe if we impute, we're about a fourth of the way through the decade. And if we impute, you know, by a factor of four, then we'll see that you're, you're at least at the same place. That's at least the current rate, which is unbelievable across seven decades, acceleration, monotone, like my mind is so blown. Um, so at this point, we're at, at a place where Peter has, you know, biographies written about him, like this one by Indian Statistical Institute for a talk that he recently gave. And you can, you can go read it and it looks, it looks pretty like, you know, complete. That's, that's like a complete story of his scientific career. It goes on and on. I'm just showing you the first page. Um, now, uh, so recently David Cox passed away and in the uh, journal Significance and actually very recent Edition, the cover has this quote from Sir David Cox, which where he says, in a sense, the only thing that matters is if you can look back when you reach a vast, vast age and say, have I done something reasonably in accord with my capability? If you can say, yes, okay, my feeling is in one sense, I've done that. Uh, many people would agree. So the thing is, you know, Peter's already at the stage where he can say that. He's not actually by my book at a vast, vast age. Uh, I feel that the, the health and vitality seem to be there from the outside. Um, and maybe a good omen, I find the following thing helpful. So you've seen this picture last night. Uh, there's Peter Bickle, and he's standing next to Ingram Olkin who was, you know, spry well into his 90s. And, and there's Ted Anderson. Ted's widow is my neighbor. So I just want you to realize that Ted lived quite a long time. And uh, even thanks to, I think, John Shing, uh, published posthumously, 99 years after he was born, that's, that seems to suggest that being a statistician, <laughs> active in publishing and continuing in the life that we lead can be correlated with uh, achievements even into fairly extreme old age. So when I look at what's going on here, I'm reminded of the story of Euler, who actually was able to, again, you know, publish even after he had passed away because the editorial staff took time uh, to publish in those days. So things were appearing for, for years after he had passed away. And... <laughs> I expect no less from Peter. I don't want to put pressure on 
in the sense that I don't want to say, you know, you have to compete with any of these people, so on and so forth. I do feel it's a very good indicator to stay active. And, and uh, Ted was, you know, definitely very active and involved and so on and so forth. So I certainly hope that that will be the case. Now, there's a, another Nancy, I just so th there's another thing which is that it's very important um, to be in a relationship, and I think Nancy's just you know the perfect partner for Peter, and he's very lucky to have her. Um, I think that there are some good indicators for longevity also based on that. So <laughs> at, at some point, the state of Massachusetts decided that the oldest living couple in Massachusetts was an eminent statistician, Herman Chernoff and his wife, Judy. Uh, I think this came out about a year ago and you know, uh, Herman was very active and so on. Judy, a very uh, involved in the community person, very delightful. So those are, those are good indicators. Um, so being a couple where there's an active statistician who's made <laughs> pen, penetrating contributions throughout their career, that's also a good indicator to reach the status of the oldest living couple in Massachusetts. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that the oldest living couple in California, if you continue to live here, will one day be you two. Now, uh, an enthusiasm of Herman and Judy was to have the department have dances. In fact, my wife and I were at a dance about uh, nine years ago at Harvard after uh, a seminar there where Herman and Judy danced together. So if they made it to the uh, senior couple of the state of Massachusetts, maybe part of the ingredient is not just statistics, but their dance interests. <laughs> Now, uh, Peter and Nancy have always been dancers, and I hope you'll keep dancing through life as time goes by. That's all. Thank you, David. That's really touching. So any comments? things you want to share. Let's thank David, Yadun, and all of the speakers for the program again.